Welcome, welcome, welcome to a little bowl of goodness. <laughs> Actually, a care collab with a little bowl of goodness. I want to say thank you to everybody that is joining us today here. Yes, I did send out the emails, but this is on behalf of Fernanda Nathimento Orchids and Succulents, who got in touch with me to inform me that her Catlia Cernua is in bloom. She did a video on it, and then behind the scenes, we coordinated the fact that let's do a care collab, seeing as, my goodness, if an orchid is in bloom, let's feature it, let's showcase it. Here we are list of all the channels participating will be in the description below so if my setup my climate the changes i've made for my catlia cernua are not something that appeals to you or that you're wary of or would not fit in your environment there are several other options for you to go and have a look at to see if any of those are more feasible meanwhile thank you so much for watching my video i really really appreciate it this little bowl of goodness. I wish I could zoom in a little bit more successfully on my little Catlia Cerna here, but I'm going to be using still photography to get my point across, to get closer into the blooms and show you this magnificent little cutie. First of all, let's start off with a fun fact. When you look at the blooms, oh my goodness, aren't they just adorable? This orchid is also called the nodding orchid, and I don't understand why. However, the setup might actually make the difference. The nodding orchid, well, when I look at that, there's also another thing, and that is the fun fact. It is pollinated by hummingbirds, which are attracted by the warm colors. And for me, that makes this little orchid even more charming. But the sticky pollen are deposited on the bird's beak. And while most orchid pollen are yellow, the hummingbird pollinated orchids pollen are darker in color. And that is what you see in the column, the darkness there. It's not the bloom aging, it's the dark pollen. A bright yellow pollen in this case would produce a sharp visual contrast against the color of the dark hummingbird beak, which would stimulate the bird to clean its beak, removing the pollen. So the next bloom it goes for would not be pollinated. Isn't that just the cutest thing ever? So by magic and perfection of nature, the majority of all hummingbird pollinated orchids evolved dark pollen. It's either blue, gray, or brown, which most likely would blend in with the colors of the bird's beak. Camouflage pollen, so to speak. How cool is that? I just love the thought of hummingbirds pollinating this cute little orchid. It just fits. Tiny, tiny little bird coming in onto tiny, tiny, perfect little blooms, only to be tricked by the clever, clever orchid that it is actually just asking to pick up that pollen. You will not get any sugars out of me, but I just need you to go to the next bloom and drop the pollen where it belongs so that I can reproduce. How sweet. Anyway, that is the little fun fact about this orchid and it makes it just more adorable in my opinion. So usually it blooms around spring and I am here in December in southern Spain. Right. Because of where it comes from in South America, down Brazil, Espirito Santo, all the way to Paraguay and Bolivia, some parts of Argentina as well, does that mean that mine is out of season? Well, let me tell you, I think not, because I've had this orchid almost four years now, and it has bloomed usually, usually around January, February time, and it is way early this year. Probably something I had to do with the manipulation of the setup, and we'll get to that. So no, in cultivation, these cuties will actually bloom whenever they're ready to bloom. Normally through the colder months of the year, leading up into spring, but in their natural habitat, they will generally bloom in spring. So if you have this orchid and you see it blooming and you think it's out of season, well, in cultivation, don't worry about it. It'll bloom whenever, which makes this one a great one to have in your collection as well. But in my case, it just blooms around the coldest months of the year, despite being earlier this time around. And honestly, for this care collab, I was not anticipating to have my orchid in bloom, considering what she has been through. 
This orchid can grow mounted and for many, many years I've had her mounted. She came to me as a tiny, tiny little three or four bulb division and I put her on a mount in organic with a little sphagnum moss and she did really well. And she grew and grew and grew and I had to keep changing the sphagnum moss every six months because of how wet I have to keep her in my very hot, dry climate here. So at the beginning of the season of 2021, I nervously and very, very reluctantly took her off the mount, changed her setup into a semi-hydro setup, classic semi-hydro setup, but took the cultivation successes that I've had with Rapiculus lalias and repeated that with her. She is potted up in mainly lava rock, large lava rock, and interspersed into the lava rock is Akadama, to raise the humidity levels because I have none here for the majority of my year. It was a massive gamble for me. She did have new roots growing when I changed her setup, so I waited for that moment. And apart from looking a little bit wonky because she had been in a mount, light training is not that easy with this one because of her tiny, tiny compact little structures. I had to sort of fundangle her into a position in a pot where she wouldn't be burying her own new growth. However, now that she is in a pot, oh my goodness, life is so much easier and we are getting along fabulously because even now that she is in that pot, the light is coming mainly from the top anyway. So her growth are now starting to go naturally up and not the creepy crawly kind that they would have while on a mount. I have 19 blooms this season, 19 more than I even expected. I had 30 blooms last time she bloomed for me and it was just magnificent. But these 19 blooms, you cannot imagine my delight especially with this care collab because I thought I was going to show you my pot, explain my process and we'll see you next year. But no, her growths, her leaves popped open and in some growths I have five blooms like she used to do, some growths I have four or in this case I have two. In one growth right here I have none but that's fine, that's fine. The orchid is alive, she has settled into the pot and we're good to go now. None of these blooms are fragrant, but if they attract a hummingbird, then that means they're clever, clever little blooms. And I love this orchid for that. When it comes to fertilizing my orchid, well, I've been very, very conservative this year with fertilizer. I really wanted to get her established first and I didn't want to go all ninja on the root system that was developing. I needed that to go into the media first and foremost. But what I did do once I saw the roots disappear into the media was give her 100 parts per million of MSU fertilizer, but I was more aggressive on the seaweed front, aggressive being 40 parts per million with calcium and magnesium to encourage that root growth at least twice a month. So her fertilizer levels have been matched at this point in time only to get her established in a pot, get her situated and comfortable, in the past years, I used to do 100 parts per million of MSU fertilizer on a mount, but that would happen several times a day because of how dry and hot my climate is when she actually starts to grow her roots. Because after blooming, nothing's gonna happen for a while. So there is no need for fertilizer, but it always seemed to coincide with spring as my temperatures rose that she was starting to push roots. And that is when I would change up her sphagnum moss so that her new roots would get into fresh sphagnum moss. But then I needed to water heavily, heavily. And I was spraying with 100 parts per million two or three times a day and then flushing off the sphagnum moss with another load of water. That would be the fifth watering, but that would be plain RO water just so there would be no salt accumulation. All of that now is passe because I can just fill up the reservoir and then flush through like I would treat every other orchid in self-watering or semi-hydro just prior to refilling with fresh water or fertilizer, give her a good flush. And in doing so, I do let the water come up to the top of the media, but I'm very, very careful not to get it around the base because clearly she has just been transferred into this setup and I didn't want to rot any growths that were confused about where they were supposed to go because of her previous position on a mount and now she's in a pot. Thankfully, nothing, nothing untoward has happened to this orchid. I am 
so happy, so grateful, and very, very relieved, to be honest with you. I have noticed for the first time, though, that she has attracted aphids this season, which I've been very, very diligently and carefully with a paintbrush brushed off, used some alcohol, but went in relatively quickly with water because at the time I did not want to blast my buds here. There's another thing just to point out about this orchid. The buds, when they are young and tiny, they will look as though they might blast. This is not always a good sign when we see in color like this or like the one below, if that is visible. That is usually a color where we think, whoops, that's going to blast. Not in this case. You can see from the color on this one as opposed to the color that's just cracking open on this one right here, they are the same. Basically, she does give you the impression she is going to bud blast, but it turns out she doesn't do that either. At least not in my case, I have managed to get them all to bloom out. She lives all year round outside for me. Now, where she comes from, she can tolerate temperatures down to 10 degrees Celsius. She is considered a warm grower. And where she comes from, she's at sea level. So warm growing is all a little bit relative here. Having had the classification of Sophronites cernua in her past, she is now a Cattleya, considered a warm grower. Well, 10 degrees is not, in my books, anything warm at all. In my climate, she tolerates temperatures all the way down to 5 degrees because she lives outside all year round, whether she was mounted or now that she is in a pot with semi-hydro. I've had her protected up until now, again, just to get her established, not to stress her out, let her know I mean well. And she's been in my covered south-facing portico, where during the summer, the hottest months of the year, she's in full bright shade. And now during the winter months, when the angle of the sun drops a little bit, she does get about four or five hours of sun, filtered sun coming through and gets hit directly. She can tolerate full winter sun because that's what she had when she was on a mount. So it's not the fact that I'm protecting her from sunlight because she can't handle it. It's just that I don't want her at this point in time to have direct sun until she has established herself. And next year I will raise her up two or three shelves so that she gets the maximum light that she can take during the winter months. I'm not saying that that is why I have a lesser blooming this year. It's not a light issue. You can see whatever grew, bloomed. It is possible that I was very conservative on the fertilizer, that I didn't get the same amount of growth. It's possible. Personally, I think every time you transition an orchid from one setup to another, it takes maybe a year and a half, possibly two years, depending if you get the setup right, for the orchid to realize, yep, I'm going strong again. I have no idea if the roots that were on the mount previously have died off there, if she is surviving on a new root system, but monitoring the pseudobulbs on a regular basis to make sure that they're not desiccating too much is my key to knowing whether she's okay with doing her blooming or whether I should be cutting the spikes off. So far, she's doing okay. So let's get back to the fact that after she finishes blooming, she is just not going to do much of anything where I will just be flushing with plain RO water, keeping her, if possible, in the setup a little bit on the drier side. Of course, I'm not letting my semi-hydro setup go dry. That is not the point of this setup, but drier and that is why I use lava rock so that the roots have enough aeration around them and I don't have to think twice about my leka going too dry and desiccating the roots. So that's why I used lava rock. And then eventually late August, September, she will start with new growths. So there's a considerable amount of time from when she finishes blooming to when she starts new growths where she pretty much does nothing. In between that time period, it is possible that she will start producing some roots. That is not a given though. So if you're thinking of changing a setup of this Cattleya cernua at any given point in time, don't do it right after blooming. Wait for visible signs of active root growth before going in and taking care of the matter. And then eventually you'll see new growths coming. And here we are, new blooms. Having so radically changed the setup of my Cernua proves to me that she is vigorous, that she can take it. Now, 
Granted, I have a very mature orchid. So if you have an immature orchid and if you've only just mounted your Cernua because that is the recommended setup for them, then leave it. As long as they're small, as long as you can keep up with the needs of the orchid, there is no need to put it in a pot and think that you're doing something wrong. As soon as the orchid gets bigger, of course its requirements increase as well. And then you will know whether your climate, your environment, your humidity levels, your temperatures are able to keep up with the needs of this orchid. In my case, I had to make a calculated decision to change her setup if I didn't want to lose her. And I was tired, so tired, of always messing around with her two times a year, even though the first time I would be changing her sphagnum moss while new roots grew. But then the second time, after the sphagnum moss was all algae and icky again, I would be changing it one more time, and it wasn't during new root growth. So that was starting to annoy me. But here we are. You could consider this an update as well. <laughs> She is in bloom. She is gorgeous. I love her and I'm very grateful. I'm also very grateful for everybody that joined on this care collab. Thank you so much, Fernanda Nacimento, for the heads up. Thank you for letting me coordinate this. Really appreciate your trust in me to get this done. Everybody again that has joined, thank you very much. Links of those channels will be in the description below. Appreciate your time watching my video. If you have any questions, anything that I did not cover while I was talking about how I care for my Cattleya Cernua, please, please let me know. Be more than happy to elaborate. Have yourselves a beautiful, beautiful day on one condition, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.